Hi, Craig. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Thanks for having I'm, me. I'm very, very well, thank you. And excited to get into this interview because I think you've probably got lots of things to share. I had a brief chat with you before and, yeah, with all sorts. So we've um, got an estate agent um, agency at the moment, but I think you've been on a bit of a journey over the past um, few years to get to this point. Um, yeah. First, if you just give us a quick, yeah, quick overview of how that how that journey went and how you've got to be where you are today. Yeah, of course. Okay, so the estate agency kind of came about during lockdown. Um, we launched it officially in February twenty twenty one, um, and the idea was my wife, who was furloughed. She was an estate agent and we were kind of building it around her. She wasn't particularly well looked after with the company that she was with when she was furloughed. And that was an extension from the work that I was doing in property investment and working with working with investors. Um, so way, way, way before that, sort of since about 2008, 2009, I worked in and around the music industry, um, predominantly in Liverpool, the Northwest, but some stuff nationwide. Uh, did a lot of work with festivals so I'd help festivals with sponsorship and brand partnerships and then that extended into other rights holders outside of live music so things like uh, a popular raucous bingo club night that I won't mention by name in just in case and um, we, you know some really good stuff some really good clients uh, I kind of was looking to get out of music in about 2018, um, I, I was looking at going into sport, doing sports sponsorship stuff, but we had our second kid on the way. Didn't really want to be spending a lot of time in London at the time. Uh, working as a consultant and ended up buying an investment property. Not with any sort of grand plan, really. Just bought one. Uh, couldn't decide whether we were going to rent it out or do it up and sell it. We ended up doing it up and, doing it up and selling it. Made quite a few quid, um, sort of by accident, and realised that I could probably do a few more of them and have a few fewer clients, especially the clients that I wasn't really, that I didn't feel I was delivering for, that I wasn't really aligned with. Um, so it gave me the opportunity to sidestep a little bit, and the consultancy and the property thing sort of ran side by side. Eventually, property took over and I ended up working with investors, helping them build their portfolios in Liverpool. And the company that I used to do that was Northwall. And that evolved into an estate agency built around my wife, uh, or now wife, in, in 2021, yeah. So that's, in a nutshell, that's what's happened over the last sort of 15 years, yeah. Amazing. I'm just uh, got something about trying to guess what the club night you were talking about. Um... Oh, it's very pink. Okay. Uh, very popular in Liverpool. I think I've got an idea of it now. Um, so, uh, in terms of the property industry then, um, yeah. because there's quite a lot of people that are investing in property in Liverpool, certainly from outside of uh, yeah. outside of Liverpool as well, because I think it's had like a really high growth and it's a pretty safe place to be putting your money in. There's loads of development going on with... Obviously, starting with L Liverpool One and all what are doing up the with the Peel Ports and all that type of stuff. So, um, how how have you seen the Liverpool property industry change? Would you say over the past sort of four or five years? I think Liverpool lagged behind. Excuse me, lagged behind Manchester in terms of growth, capital growth in real estate prices, uh, and that started to catch up around about. 2019, 20, there's still still a bit of a gulf, but it meant that people that were getting in before that time frame were getting really good returns on their investment in Liverpool. And they were able to buy houses in not great condition, in you know, good areas for property investing, for rental properties, renting them to good tenants, providing good quality homes. Generally, they've got to buy a house at the right price, do it up tenant it out, and then if they were lucky, they'd be able to remortgage it at some point down the line, and because they've increased the value by X amount, they'd be able to pull out their money and go again. And Liverpool became one of the hotspots for that strategy. And as a result, loads of people flooded the market, and that pushed prices up even further for that sort of price point of property. And that became a little bit more difficult to do, so people then started diversifying and 
maybe just investing in a more traditional way, just buying and holding their property. It all slowed down a little bit. Prices were starting to go a little bit crazy. Yields were coming down before COVID. During COVID, especially the early days, those first three months, if you remember, when nobody knew what was going on in the world, mm -hmm. it was really a really difficult environment to do business. We were still able to trade or by a reduced level because our investors, some of them were overseas and they were cash. So they were able to move quickly and purchase properties where the seller needed to sell. A lot of estate agencies at that time were only trading in limited, uh, limited trading capacity. A lot of solicitors weren't taking new cases on. So it, it was quite difficult. Um, now, fast forward to now, we're still seeing a lot of overseas investment in Liverpool from uh, from Asia. Um, we are still seeing a lot of off-plan stuff being being built and developed out, although that's not something we really get too involved with, but it is important to keep the, keep those wheels turning. But those types of investment are probably for a different type of investor for the ones that we've dealt with, who you class more as not necessarily amateur investors, they knew what they were doing, but they weren't, you know, that wasn't their full-time thing necessarily. They weren't professional full-time investors. Um, now, we do work with investors from time to time, helping them not necessarily find opportunities, but if an opportunity comes to us that we know will suit them, we'll match it to them. And obviously, we do property management as well, so we'll, we can help investors look after their properties once they've bought them and tenanted them. So a big, a big mix of, of stuff then. One of the things that I've noticed from all of your um, collateral that I've looked through and your website, that you've got a bit of an affinity for marketing, haven't you? Yeah. And, and, and how things look across. Where, how did that come about? And how important do you think that has been um, on your journey over the past few years, like a, a real good focus on marketing? I think it's been crucial for our growth. I think... I think perception's everything. I think a lot of estate agencies, if you if you think about the estate agencies that you know, your local high street maybe, you'll have the established ones that's been there for 25 years and they'll market themselves as, we know the local area, we've been here for 25 years. And you'll have your corporate agents that tend to compete on price. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have a smaller agent that's perhaps not on the high street, maybe like a category B or C high street, who have started up as independent and they grow and they grow and they grow, but they kind of get trapped in this space where it's difficult for them to break the ceiling, the perception of where they position themselves early on as like a as a cheaper agency, a low value agency. We we could see that as a as a risk when we started out. So we decided that we were going, if we we're going to do things, we were going to do things what we felt were properly. And not just from a marketing side as well, because my wife had been in agency for 15, 16 years at the time, sort of operationally and ethically, we knew what how we didn't want to operate off the back of how other people did operate, where she'd worked and where I bought and sold from and through. Um, but like my interest in brands and marketing and aesthetic, I've just always been to that kind of stuff, really, from music, from film, from fashion, from magazines, from design, architecture. They're just things that... It's just a, a world that I've always been interested in. So if whenever I've been involved in any business, we've always tried to keep brand and brand identity and that kind of language, that aesthetic language, front and centre. And if you were to start all over again uh, with this, um, on this journey, with the, the business or even, even journey, because you've been in a few things over the past few years, what would you do differently? That's a really big question, that isn't it? I think if it was on the estate agency side, if I'm just talking about the last two and a half years, I'd probably have not got in my own way as much in terms of wanting things to be perfect. I'd have probably done things a little bit more quickly and moved a little bit more quickly. What type of things? Decision making, um, recruiting, um, making decisions about the suppliers and the partners that we want to work with, because 
in the state agency, people might think it's really simple, you know, go out to a house, take a photo, put it on right move. Bob's your uncle is far more complex than that. There's there's a whole host of suppliers, partners, not just sort of technology wise. There's a, we've got quite a, a good sized tech stack, which is and it's a really competitive space, prop tech, but also with individuals and consultants and advice. There's there's so many different ways you can go. And I think we were kind of a bit bamboozled at the beginning. And we could have moved a little bit quicker. Um, we also overtraded a little bit. So we had, we faced some cash flow problems, but they were probably exacerbated by the delays to conveyance in that the whole industry is experienced. And we're just kind of, that's just kind of washing through. So last year and early part of this year, I think average sale from sale degree to completion was about 150 days. And people expect it to be it to be done in ninety. So you can imagine what that does for cash flow for a growing business. It it's really difficult. Um, and I'd have probably pushed our letting side of the business much earlier and much harder. Um, having the recurring revenue that sort of smooths out the lumps of the sales process. If I mean, there's a, there's a host of reasons why we didn't push that early doors, but perhaps that was a mistake. In terms of everything else that I've done. Businesses that I've been involved in in the past, whether it's been me on my own or me as part of teams or whether I've been employed or had, you know, like a, a contract to roll within a business. I did a bit of learning about myself in about 2020, 2021 and understood a little bit more about what helps make me tick and what I'm not so good at. And I've definitely got in my own way in the past by I'm not I'm not really a doer. I'm not really a finisher. I need to I need to have a team around me. And this is the first business where, even though I'm saying I could have recruited quicker, this was the first business where I very deliberately said, Well, I'm not I'm not front and center in this. I'm not going out to people's houses. I'm not the because I'm not I'm not the agent here. I need a team of people who understand how it's going to work. I'll help grow the business and build the framework and set the values and the tone and grow it in a B2B way. I think if I hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have lasted more than six to nine months. We'd have we'd have burned through all of our cash really quickly. Because I'm 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 not doing. <laughs> so like the creative problem solving type type person. Yeah, I, I yeah, it, this strengths and weaknesses to it. I spend most of my time thinking about things that we want to do rather than things that we should do, um, or th- things that should we should be doing. Should I say right now? It's interesting we said about go faster. Um, I always think like business like speed. You know, yeah. if you think about what is current seats, current like the fact you know the faster you can go, the faster you can get it you know, get it flowing. If you go slow and it, the water goes stagnant, you know, it's it's a bad place to be, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we're, we're constantly looking at that innovation curve and what th- the things that we can introduce that sort of keep us, maintain our place in the market, but allow us to grow by having a point of difference that offer more value to our clients. And over time, hopefully, once we can, once we start to demonstrate that value in a really consistent way, we can increase our fees and, and profitability and so on. So you've hired a bunch of team members now. Um, what has been the biggest learning that you've had from being employer and being an employer and hiring these people? That it's very, very difficult working with your wife. <laughs> that's, that's really tough. But she finds it more difficult working with her husband. I bet she does, yeah. Um, I think your people are your greatest asset, aren't they? So, like, we we value our team. We we pay them their basic salaries are above industry average. They they get um, perks and incentives, and you know we we look after them. We'll we'll do nights out and dinners, and we there's a yoga studio in our building that we pay for them to come and do yoga and reiki and training and development. So we 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 really try and look after them and foster their not just their sort of professional development as an agent, but also their personal development as an individual, because we have want you, them. Have you always done that? Or is that something that you've thought, I need to do this? So, you know, was there like a turning point where you made that decision or is it something that you've always thought about doing? It's something that I've always been interested in individually. <laughs> so from day one, they had things like Medicash cover and things like that. And we've always had nights out and bits and pieces. But as the team's grown and as we moved offices, the opportunity to oh do you know what our friends Amy does Reiki and we can offer it to our team 
that's a great thing. Do you know, there's a financial planner in our building. Why don't we get them to come in and educate the team a little bit more on the decisions they're making around their pension? You know, just giving them something more than money. We just laid it on top. Yeah. 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 And there'll be more and there'll be there'll continue to be more. And I think we couldn't do what we do without them. And you know, there's always things as a business that we could we could do to improve. I don't think any of the team are doing anything underperforming or doing anything wrong on an individual basis. We're 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 on this journey together and it's really important to me that everybody is bought into what it is that we're trying to achieve as a team. The, the, the people that we've got now, I hope are going to be with us on this journey for the next five, 10 years. Mm. And it, it really does feel like that's what we've got at the minute. Do you think any of that stuff has, do you think it's directly affected the bottom line? Do you think it's helped with retent? What, what would you say that that is it from a commercial? Well, interestingly, I, I sent a survey out last week. So I'm trying to move away. One of the, one of the things I'm trying to find really is my own it, my style of leadership or management, if you like, because I don't see myself as a day to day manager. And I got in this sort of cycle of doing things like key performance indicators and skills matrices and things that felt too corporate for a small agency like ours, but things that helped to identify areas of improvement nonetheless. But I was talking to some other people that I know who probably probably got a slightly softer approach. So we found other ways of working with the team to identify areas where they might need support or they need help or how they're feeling. And part of that process was sending out um, a survey on time form just to see how they felt about the business, how they feel when they come into work. Would they recommend working here? What did they think of the, the, the package that they're on and all that kind of stuff? So the feedback we got from that was that they're all really happy with it. So does it affect bottom line? Well, I'd say it affects productivity, which in turn affects bottom line, yeah. Um, they understand the relationship between. I try and I I try to not have them focus too much on the outputs of the business. I want them to focus on process and input, not in a boring way, but like you do that job, and that looks after that, and that looks after that, and then at the end, when it all comes back down, there's going to be enough money in the pot for everyone to get paid. And they understand the relationship between their actions or lack of, and <laughs> where we are as a business. So yeah. That's an interesting take that you want them just to focus on inputs and the way that you've built it. And I guess then you're like, I'll worry about the output. You just do the input. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. We like it. Um, so how do you manage your personal life and business life then, Craig? Uh, with, you know, working with your partner as well. Yeah, it's, it's tough. You know, I... There's pros and cons, right? So, you know, I, I got up at five this morning. I went for a run. I went to the gym. Anybody could do that before they go to work, I guess. I came back. I walked my kids to school. And I started work at quarter past 20 past nine. I'm working from home today. I had a, I was on a call with a coach this morning. Then I had a call, a, a course that I'm doing. And then this. And then I've got another course this afternoon. Today's like a learning and development day for me. I try and keep Thursdays for this type, this type of stuff. I'll go for a walk in the middle of the day. Sometimes I'll go for a run, I'll go for a ride. So I, I get to do stuff that you wouldn't get to do if you were working for somebody else. Um, I don't tend to work evenings, but I do work weekends because I enjoy what I do. So I don't see myself as, oh my God, I've got to do that. I've got to get caught up on that. I love what I do. Mm -hmm. And the work I'll do out of hours tends to be sort of more de developmental strategic work. But it does eat into home life. It does eat into personal life. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not an elite Olympic athlete who's saying that in order for me to achieve an Olympic gold, I've got to make sacrifices. But I think balance is different for everybody, isn't it? And I think I know that if I'm not, if I've got something that I need, feel I need to get done or if I need to exercise or whatever, that manifests in me being miserable and grumpy and <laughs> not good to be around so it's probably better for everybody that's around me to allow me to scratch mm -hmm. the itch that I need to scratch and then they'll get much more out of me when I am around and I'll, and I'll give every I'll give everything that I've got and be really present and really engaged and I think as long as I'm a, I'm a self-aware enough to manage that and monitor that really at this stage it's probably the best I can do 
Thanks. Um, you mentioned that during the COVID situation and with the conveyancing delays, yeah. you had some there were some cash flow issues. You didn't start the rental side of the business to give you that constant, you know, monthly recurring revenue. Yeah. What advice would you have for other business owners that may be going through cash flow challenges? Um, yeah. So financial management advice would you would you give them? Speak to your bank just as early as possible. Don't bury your head in the sand. Um, be very critical of your spend. Look at your look at your cash flow forecasting. Look at where you're spending money where you don't need to. Um, speak to some of your suppliers and see if they're happy for you, even if you're on contracted terms, to maybe suspend the service for a period of time or take some kind of payment on holiday. Um, ultimately. There's m- multiple ways of raising finance, be that from personal reserves, friends and family, investors giving away equity, debt, factoring, depending on what it is that you, you know, service you offer or products you sell. Yes, there are people's jobs at risk. And yes, there are uh, massive, massive downsides. But when we first started the business and we were facing problems like that, I I'd I'd find it all consuming. The stress from it was all consuming. And then one day I just thought, well, I've got my health, I've got my family, I've got the kids. As long as I've got them, everything's okay. What's the what's the worst that can happen? And when you look at things with a what's the worst that can happen perspective, the sort of all the impending crushing dread of, oh my God, I've got to find that ten thousand pounds or whatever it is. You see it in a different way and you can solve problems in a more creative way. So I would say speak to all the stakeholders that you need to speak to, face up to it, but also try and get a bit of perspective on it. Go for a walk. Amazing. Mixed with gratitude and yeah. And also I love that. What's the worst that can happen? Can I live with that? Well, yeah, let's move on then. Yeah. That, and that's what you can do. You can lick your wounds out and you're going to move forward. Wonderful. So just to begin to wrap up then Craig where would you where do you see yourself in five years time five years time I'm going out for dinner with my wife tonight and this is going to be on the topic of conversation because we did talk about at some point perhaps moving overseas still having the business here but sort of splitting our time I don't know whether that will still happen but we need to make a decision because kids will be going to going to big school um, realistically, the plans that we've got for the business over the next 12 to 24 months will shape the next five to 10 years. So we've got Northwall. Our plan was always to collaborate with another agent. This is related to this, the reason we didn't launch Lettings initially, because we were going to collaborate with an agent that did. That didn't happen. We ended up buying another agency in South Liverpool, in Hale Village that was going to shut its doors and that changed the complexion of our business. So instead of trying to pick off geographic areas, we decided to focus on a specific type of property and move to a non-high street office, a serviced office, so that we could be a bit more sort of geographically agnostic. And that office will become a head office for accounts and marketing and property management and all the kind of back office stuff over time. And we probably will have some high street locations but what it's opened up to us is the opportunity to have lots of complementary businesses that run alongside it. So we we are setting up um, maintenance businesses, cleaning businesses, facilities management, financial services, all of the kind of, not obvious, but all of the things that sit well with our agency. They're the sort of businesses that we are either in the middle of launching or talking to people to collaborate with on launching over the next 12 to 24 months. So in five years time, I see myself running the business that kind of sits across the top. And there'll be MDs in charge of all the businesses, including Northwall. And I'll I'll, I'll be up at the top with maybe two or three of the other uh, two or three of the other MDs helping run that business and shape that. That's the plan. Amazing. And I feel like I could ask you a few more questions about that. So <laughs> interesting. Do you think that obviously um, the world's changing? You don't necessarily need a front retail outlet. You need a decent website, decent marketing. Do you yeah. think your two think? How do you think that number one, your ability to market versus just having a shop front, and number two, the new 
world that we live in means that people don't necessarily need to walk in. How has that affected that decision making? I, mean, I, I agree with the sentiment. I think we know that it depends very much on where you are situated geographically. But in 2023, most of the people that walk into an estate agency office in the areas that we operate, they're probably not looking to sell their home and they're probably not even looking to buy one. They're just having a look, they're having a nose. They might they might be a very early stage inquiry. What, what do you charge and would you like to come out? Well, they might come in three, four, five times. They're not a primed. Uh, ready to buy. But, yeah, they're not, they're not ready to buy. Or so. Um, so uh, the way I would justify the cost of having a high street office would be the brand awareness and the perception. I think it's a very expensive piece of branding. Mm-hmm. It gives people a nice place to work, but essentially it's, it's a branding piece. Um, now, there are different parts of different sort of property quartiles where having the office is more effective than not. Higher end, I think it's nice for have people to come in and sit down. But where we are now in our serviced office, we've got our own front door. You can come through the main building. I don't know if you know Liverpool Road Studios in Crosby, but mm-hmm. the, the, we've got two restaurants. We've got an Italian restaurant and we've got like a sort of British style bistro. Both fantastic. So, you know, if, if people want to come to our office and see us, instead of having a cup of Nescafe and a chip mug, sat at an old desk from the 90s, they can go and have a flat white or a glass of wine in a restaurant at the front. So we feel like we've got the best of both worlds. People can still come in and see us, but, oh, let's go and have a proper meeting. Let's go and have a proper chat. Let's go have a bit of lunch. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that both have their place. They just serve different markets and different styles of agents in slightly different ways. Moving forward, I think di- digital is obviously the way things are going, but I think it, it's always nice to have a point of difference, you know, physical marketing and sort of letter writing and, um, you know, good quality, well-designed printed material always goes a long way in my view. Definitely. Makes the makes the intangible tangible, especially the kinesthetic people that can yeah. so now as a real company because I can feel it in my hands, even though it's not the company, it's a piece of paper. Bang, bang on. Like, so, so during, since we started, we spent a load of money on Facebook ads and YouTube and Google. So we, we were quite far ahead with that. And then a lot of other agents, because the last couple of years, it honestly, it was list the house, stick it on, right move. You've got 20 offers. It was easy to sell, to sell property. But we were still marketing then because we knew that that wasn't going to last forever. When that, when that market changed, every other agent, you could see them starting to spend money on Facebook. But they were starting with a cold start and they were all competing with each other. So we stopped spending money on Facebook and we put that money into something else because we had we built an audience there that we could market to without spending money on it. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Craig, it's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you. Um loads of interesting um nuances and learnings, I think, for everyone watching. So yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for um yeah, giving us the interview. Thanks for having me. It's been great.